research uh, represents part of the methodology uh, that I used for some of my PhD research uh, that looks at the experiences and practices of civil society actors and seeking to engage in peace building activities and activities to enhance their security in post-war Sri Lanka. Uh, so this is part of the methodology uh, that we use in the research process. And sorry, my name's Janelle. <laughs> um, my name's Eric, and I'm just gonna give a little explanation as to where I'm from. Um, um, my background is mediation, conflict resolution. I've been sitting with people in conflict for 10 years plus now. Um, I currently work with the Oxford Youth Defending Services, restorative justice worker, so young people that cause crimes and those that have been affected by them, bring them together, have conversations about that. And just sort of how those practical things that I use every day sort of fit with this. Uh, so just um, a brief overview of the presentation we're gonna give. Um, I'll just briefly kind of contextualize uh, the kind of motivation for um, where I'm coming at this research from in terms of kind of current state of conflict research in respect to the everyday. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the specific research context. Um, then Eric will introduce the actual methodology and talk a bit about what restorative inquiry is. Um, and then I'll apply it to how I used it or how we used it other in Sri Lanka, okay? Um, so in terms of my desire in my research to get at this kind of question of what were some of the kind of everyday experiences and practices that civil society actors in Sri Lanka were either uh, experiencing or engaging in uh, in the post-war period? Um, a lot of this comes at this kind of, or comes from rather, this desire in conflict literature to kind of move away, at least in the kind of on the theoretical or conceptual side, to move away from kind of overarching blueprint approaches to peace building. Uh, we often hear this talked about uh, in the context of liberal peace building and the kind of application of a certain kind of liberal peace model um, and this desire to kind of get at this question of the everyday, the local, the grassroots, etc. Um, and I've just put out some examples there of how the everyday is being conceived of in some of the literature. Um, one of the things though that I certainly came across in seeking to engage in, in this kind of research was that there's lots of conceptual literature out there about this notion of the everyday or this notion of the local but a lot less about how to actually go out and try to, to engage with this kind of everyday or to understand it or to kind of research it. And so I was really interested in trying to come to a kind of up with a methodology that would enable me to try to engage in uh, some of these issues. Uh, so as I was mentioning, just the research context, um, there's this real challenge for me in trying to kind of think about how to kind of get at this question of the experiences of civil society actors uh, in post-war Sri Lanka, in situations where many of them have been made uh, very insecure, not only from the conflict, but are continuing to be insecure in the post-war period now. Um, and the kind of, I was very interested in understanding the everyday as this kind of daily constraints that people experience kind of on and through their daily experiences, how they go about their daily activities and seeking uh, to engage in the kind of peace building or security enhancing activities that they do, um, but also, how they exercise agency and how they actually, it, within this environment where they are made quite vulnerable, actually are, are engaging in their type of work and um, often a great danger to themselves. So in recognizing that <laughs> this environment's obviously very emotionally charged, um, and I would be likely to be uh, engaging with people and uh, talking to them about kind of very sensitive or potentially traumatic and quite emotional uh, experiences and experiences that they had often, I mean, they were very personal to themselves, they had experienced firsthand. Um, there's this question, again, came up about how do I go about this? How do we go about engaging in this type of uh, process where they might, we might be willing to, they might be willing to share on the one hand, but also really put them at the center of this research as the experts in the research, as the people who had that knowledge, not that I had that knowledge, but that they very much had this knowledge um, and that they were the experts in this. So I'll turn it over to Eric to uh, introduce the methodology. So I guess using those parameters of, you know, getting them to talk about emotionally charged, sensitive sort of issues, um, we, we sort of turn to sort of what restorative justice does. And restorative justice is usually applied in a criminal justice setting. The knowledge, understanding, and skills, however, um, are transferable to many other settings. Uh, restorative approaches is often a term used as an umbrella term. Um, which encapsulates the uh, restorative language, uh, restorative inquiry, which we'll explain, as well as potentially restorative.
for the meeting. Um, whilst restorative justice involves repairing harm caused through offending, restorative approaches works to build and repair relationships. Um, it it were, is applied in schools, neighborhoods, workplaces, a variety of contexts. Um, how I use the restorative inquiry is it, basically uh, once I know about a crime and, and who's been involved in it, uh, I do separate meetings with people. The restorative inquiry is my one-to-one -one communication conversation I have with somebody and how I go about getting what they want out of something or what's important to them about something. Um, so, although you know we have deviated from the main goal of restorative approaches, which is bringing people together for a, for a conversation about how to move forward with things. I think we've stayed true to the spirit of restorative practice in relation to attitude, skills, and process. And really, restorative inquiry is a combination of all those. Uh, attitude is basically the values, beliefs, principles that guide, motivate, and inform us as researchers, our actions and approach to research. Um, so if your attitude mindset on talking to somebody is in the right frame, the process of skills you use will get something that's going to be meaningful, hopefully, for everybody. Uh, restorative approaches seeks to create an ethos of respect and inclusion. Commitment to be non judgmental, collaborative, and encouraging the exercise of one's own agency. Um, keeping in mind some of the ethical considerations for any researcher, these are the values and principles of the research inquiry. I'm not going to go through all the uh, words in, in black there, but just to say that voluntariness, impartiality, inclusion, respect, listening, non judgmental, be non judgmental, honesty, safety, self determination, and confidentiality are all critical aspects of uh, principles of the research uh, the restorative agenda. Um, it's a combination of skills when you're sitting with somebody, uh, asking open and narrative-based questions, uh, utilizing your active listening skills, and how do you get someone to just say more, keep talking to you about something, facilitating dialogue, summarizing and empathy, um, encouraging others to take ownership of the problem, and, and just really creating a space where people can just share their Um, the restorative inquiry process is um, basically made up of five questions. Now, we don't just rely on these five questions in, in a simple form like this. We do modify it. Uh, but basically what we're trying to do is get the spirit behind each question. So it really is a what happened question is, is your initial starting point. You want to know their unique perspective about whatever it is that they're involved in. Um, based on that broader question, you get a, quite an expansive narrative at times. Often you'll get little lights or moments that really mean something to them. You pick up on those and you want to know a little bit more about what they were thinking, how they're feeling with those key moments or those things that were really going on for them. Um, from what they just shared, you know, who else has been affected by this or how have you been affected by this? Really just expands upon who else could be involved. Yeah. What do you need to feel better about this? Um, very simple question, but you know we're not just talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, although that does come up. Um, I'm thinking about needs more from a dispute resolution perspective. Needs um, based on hopes, fears, wants, desires, um, yeah, things like that. And then, you know, not not that we're sort of going to implement something with them at times from research, but you know, this is a nice thing to ask them. Based on our conversation, sometimes we get little moments of insight. What needs to happen to put that forward for you, move things forward for you, put that right? What do you want to do about that? And just really important, these uh, questions were created by Dr. Belinda Hopkins of Transforming Conflict, so really important to give her credit for that. Okay, so just uh, now moving on to contextualize some of that framework in the case of Sri Lanka. Um, just very quickly, uh, Sri Lanka's been characterized as a really kind of textbook, quote unquote, example of an ethnic or ethno nationalist conflict. Um, the part of the, because I, I very much view the Sri Lankan conflict as an ongoing conflict, um, the part of, the, or the component rather, in terms of doing my research that I was interested in is the post-war process. So this begins from 2009 and is ongoing now, but the, in the, again, the context of the framing of my research, it was 2009 to the period of 2012. It's a way of bookending the research. Um, and it very much is coming from this view of Sri Lanka as being a case of uh, what's referred to in the literature as a victor's peace. So it's a post-war setting in which one side has uh, almost entirely militarily defeated the other and has proceeded to institutionalize a post-war peace um, that generally or often uh, has little regard for those vanquished. 
Uh, in the case of the Sri Lankan government, it's been able to impose a political settlement that focuses largely on security and stabilization, seen through both uh, a counterinsurgency strategy as well as an economic development strategy. Uh, so again, just for uh, time's sake, I'll move right along <laughs> into how, this, how the methodology that Eric outlined uh, was applied in this case. So I haven't actually put, uh, the next several slides will uh, outline a, a question that was asked with respect to kind of each of the process elements of the restorative inquiry and a section of uh, the respondents or research participants answer to that question. Obviously, um, it's a very narrative based process, so their answers to questions were very long and often went on for several minutes, but just to give you kind of an idea. Um, I haven't put one up for the kind of what happened question, uh, just because this question is very broad and usually leads to a very, a very long narrative uh, response initially. Um, but what I will say here is that this uh, initial kind of narrative that comes out of the original question, which is quite broad, really kind of shapes the focus for the rest of the narrative inquiry, the restorative inquiry process. Um, and at certain moments in these narratives, um, there appears, as you're listening to them, there's a, a key moments or key issues that people will either go on uh, at length for, or there'll be a shift in body language, um, they may become quite emotional. There's, there's kind of a noticeable thing that, that comes up in these narratives and think, oh, that's, that's something that's quite important for this individual or this group that you're talking to. Um, and so these moments, you, I would, or we would jot them down and come back to them, um, again, through the notion of thoughts and feelings type questions. So these questions are really uh, intended to go back to these moments and really get at them in a greater depth and in a, in a greater detail. I and mean, often they, they can be issues that might otherwise not be explored um, because they tend to be quite emotional. Um, in our case, we found research participants were generally open to discussing them. Sometimes people weren't, and that was, that was fine, obviously. Um, but in general, most of the participants were, were willing to talk about these types of issues, um, but they were often quite, quite emotionally charged. Uh, so in terms of the who has been affected and how question, this question really encourages participants to, again, think about how they or their organization or the communities that they work with have been affected, um, but also gets them to think, again, about not only sort of the immediate community, but perhaps uh, others as well. So kind of going beyond the immediate community, thinking about the country, thinking about perhaps in the Sri Lankan case, those in the diaspora, et cetera. Um, really interestingly, between uh, the who's been affected and the thoughts and feelings questions, again, these are emotion, quite emotionally charged. In one instance, uh, something that I found really interesting came up was we were interviewing a very prominent religious figure, and uh, at one point in the interview, they became uh, very paranoid, actually. Um, they really wanted to continue to speak to us, but they were very, very worried about who could possibly hear them, and we were speaking to them in the church, um, and they were very, very worried about other members of the church reporting on them, and they actually became very concerned for our own safety in carrying out this type of work. So I think this kind of who has been affected is really interesting from the perspective not only in the past, but also how these kinds of uh, impacts and experiences continue to affect in the present also. Uh, and then again, just quickly, this ties into this whole question of needs um, and getting, uh, as Eric mentioned, getting participants to think about uh, hopes, fears, interests, desires, things that they need to be able to either feel better about the situation or to move on and uh, largely also pertaining to just their own safety or security, particularly in the everyday, just going about um, their daily activities. Sorry, I'm moving really quick because I'm running out of time. <laughs> in terms of the future focus, uh, this isn't necessarily a, like a solution-driven type of thing, but it gets to this question about what might be ways of moving forward, or what are fears? In the Sri Lankan case, some are very fearful of the fact that large-scale conflicts could erupt again, uh, or warfare, if some of these underlying tensions aren't resolved at some point. So it can get at a number of different uh, types of issues. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just want to wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> are we over the time? Uh, we do have a minute. Okay. Where did you go? <laughs> it's your research. Okay, uh, well, just quickly, I'll say a few things. Um, Particularly, I guess, the, the main point I'll make before we wrap it up and people can maybe ask us about some of the other conclusions and questions, but just that um, I think this research is really well suited to exploratory research or experientially based research where the research questions that you're interested in are quite open. Um, I think I would caution anyone about using this if they were looking to do something that was very much testing specific hypothesis 
or very specific variables. It's really not that type of research approach, but um, I think in terms of, of exploratory type things and really putting the research participants at the center as research experts, it's a really uh, interesting way to go about it. Okay, 